Welcome to Saturday. This is my uh, favorite service of the month because uh, we get to chit chat while I'm teaching. You don't get to do that on Fridays. Mm -hmm. I like chit chatting up to a certain point. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of marriage, um, how many are, people are married here? Okay, so. So everybody will understand the real things in life. <laughs> now, I'm going to share some couple of things with you today. This one I passed out. Uh, we have enough of them. Uh, we need some more. Oh. We need more. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, I I listed uh, this list here is what you're going to be ministering to in your future, hopefully. You're going, going into the ministry in Romania, right? Okay, so they have these kinds of people in Romania. They have them everywhere. This uh, covers all people. <laughs> and these are the people you're going to be ministering to. Last night we had several of them at the altar here. Every week we have them here. And uh, because of the kind of ministry we're in, we get an unusually high percent of these kinds of people coming down here because they tend to be the more more troubled. Okay, um, most of these people were not raised in good families. Uh, they didn't have very decent parents. Most of them, not all, and uh, they've got emotional problems from childhood. They got mental problems from childhood. And then it got worse as they grew older. And so Paul brilliantly lists all these people that Timothy is going to be ministering to in 2 Timothy. Spectacular. He audits them and says, Now, Timothy, you've got to be brave. He said, God has not given you the spirit of cowardice, but of love and of power and a sound mind, and you're going to need it. And he gives the list of why he's going to need to have a sound mind and love and power because these people he's going to be ministering to require enormous amount of patience. Amen. And, and particularly if you're married to some one of these, it's really tough because it's in your house, not just down here. Well, last night at the altar, um, a couple came down for prayer, and uh, Rick had already seen them for three hours before they came to the service. Spent three hours with them, and uh, I didn't know who they were. I had I had not seen them, but uh, the guy was uh, very blocked, and the wife was on um, a life's mission to fix him. She wanted to fix him. And she was doing everything in her power to fix the guy. And uh, I saw right through that. And so uh, when she got convicted of what she was doing, I said to her, uh, hey, you're, you're destroying yourself and your husband. You're ruining everything. And this is all your fault. You're making him worse. You're making him sicker. She just fell on the carpet. Bang. Right there. God convicted her. And she repented. Yeah. So they're going to come down again next week or a week or so from now for a counseling session. But um, if you're married to somebody who uh, is one of these people here, the... Um, devil is going to try to encourage you to fix them and help them. He wants you to do everything in your power to help this person, your daughter, your son, uh, your wife. And it's all a trick to get you to exhaust yourself trying to fix someone who's not fixable now that you're helping them. We had some hope for them to be healed before you stepped in to help. But when you decided 
to take matters in your own hands and fix it yourself, that, that was the end. Now we're doomed. And so it eventually becomes an obsession. You give somebody some advice, they don't take it. You raise and reason with them, they don't listen. They agree to change, then they do the opposite. And this uh, Chinese water torture pattern of torment starts to wear you down. Anybody who's ever had a loved one who was a drug addict knows exactly what I'm talking about. They are exhausted and worn out trying to save that person's soul. It is a trick of the devil to destroy you and uh, it works almost 100% of the time. Almost 100% of the time. At some point, if you could let that person go and let God break them, uh, they would change, they would start listening. So sometimes uh, prison is good, sometimes car wrecks are good, sometimes uh, deaths in the family are good. Traumatic events that come into people's lives allows the person to reboot their thinking process. And if there's no trauma, they'll just drift on out to the end and die. They never change. They'll leave you, you'll leave them, uh, they'll, maybe they'll find another victim, but they're just going to go right on out to the grave and drop dead. They're not going to get fixed. So if you can get the person to let that person go and let God do whatever he needs to do to them, and sometimes it's traumatic, <clears throat> you got a shot at seeing them saved and healed. How many times have we gone over that? No, red flag. You're sick. I'm sick. I'm trying to fix him. Brother Mike's an idiot. No, you got sucked into a codependent recovery system that you are being destroyed. You're being ruined. And you're going down. It's the exact opposite of what people think. Well, all this person needs is love. Okay? Uh, my family never watches these teachings, so I can, <laughs> I can get away with a couple of things. My ex-mother-in-law, she, she, she died uh, last year, uh, was a busybody uh, controller. And uh, she tried to do that to me and Karen. She, she, she'd been doing that to my wife since she was that high. And uh, if a person is a controller and their IQ isn't very high, they will then resort to soulish emotional manipulations. You don't like me, you don't love me, you, you hate me. Uh, they will go to the grassroots of control to get you, because they can't intellectually get you to do what they want, so they're going to have to do it emotionally. They're not smart enough to manipulate you intellectually, they got to do it emotionally. You don't love me, you don't hate me, you disrespect me, uh, you hate my family, you can't stand my pet, whatever they have to tell you to get you to have a sense of shame or guilt then they will, then they can get you to, oh, well, you'll give in. Oh, geez, you're right. okay, I'll do it. And uh, we went through one of these sieges with her, with my mother in law, uh, before I got delivered, before I went through deliverance in 2004. So I didn't understand at that time, I was being sucked into a vortex 
of demonic idiocy. Uh, calling out things, giving them examples of their stupidity. Why did you do it? You know, and uh, my father-in-law wrote me an email and said, well, all, all, uh, you're, all she needs is love. And then the next year, after I found out I had demons and went through deliverance, I had a complete flip uh, of attitude toward my mother-in-law. And when she died, I was her favorite person in the family. Not her daughter, not her husband. <laughs> she didn't like her husband. <laughs> I was the only relative she liked. I had completely flipped my attitude. And then I just showed her love. I would listen to her. Uh, if you've ever had an elderly person in your family, you listen to the same story 20, 30 times over a period of years, and they don't remember they told you. So under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the power of God, the supernatural power, the, the power that split the Red Sea, I patiently listened to the story for the, for the 50th time. The Red Sea miracle is easier than that. Because you know exactly what sentence is coming next. And you're fighting off total emotional exhaustion. Yeah, I remember that. You left your pants over there and then the dog ate the... I could tell the story to her. You know what happened to me one time? I do, Mom. But I didn't. I said, what a what? <laughs> I would say, no, no, what happened? And then I would get the same story again. And, oh, man, that's amazing. Well, what'd you do? I, mean, I already knew what she did. So I'm, I'm feeding into the story because she needed somebody to listen to her. And, uh, you know, initially, I mistreated her. And so the devil had me tricked. Well, you got to straighten these people out. They're idiots. <laughs> I was the idiot. <laughs> so when she died, uh, I was in a room when she died. She was just looking right at me. And her eyes got big as saucers. I could see the whites all the way around her eyes. She was looking to my right here. And I was praying in tongues and she was staring to my right. I said, Mom, who's that? Who are you looking at? And she died. So I knew she had probably seen her guardian angel or something. Somebody came for her. <clears throat> he was, whatever it was was standing next to me. He was looking right over here. And wide-eyed, like, unbelievable, what's that? You know, so I, I knew she wasn't looking at me. She's seen me before. <clears throat> so, patience. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. And with these kind of people here, <clears throat> you need patience up the yin yang because these people are being controlled by the spirit world. This isn't a fleshly battle, this is a spiritual war. So, that lady last night partially repented. So, usually if they hit the floor crying, that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign something positive is happening. Uh, if they run off giving you that, uh, again, I'm a body language reader. Uh, that's usually a bad sign. F you, Mike. Love you. Bye. Uh, that's not good. 
Okay, so the Holy Ghost was there. All right. So anybody not been here before? You've been here before? Okay. <clears throat> you haven't? Okay. All right. Well, I'll do this one real quick. <laughs> this is uh, how God built every human being. They're all built the same. They have five parts. And here they are. And each one of those parts works uh, individually and collectively at the same time. This is your uh, cockpit of the plane. It's your mind. Your mind's in your brain. And uh, your, uh, your future is based on your free will. God will not violate your free will. He gave you free will when he created you. You're not a pet. You are a child. A child of God. And you make your own decisions. The demons <clears throat> want to control your mind and force you to make decisions that they want. God will influence your mind and he will convict your conscience to get you to voluntarily do what's right. But he will not force you to do it. God doesn't force people to do things that are right. He, he suggests it. And then he waits to see if you are going to do it. If you decide you don't want to do it, you then have to reap what you sow and the consequences of your behavior. Everybody has to face that. Everybody faces the consequences of their own behavior, their own thinking pattern, their own free will. What you do for God in life doesn't depend on God. It depends on you. God has all this for you. But if you only take that much, then that's all he's going to give you. If you take that much, that's what he'll give you. If you want the whole enchilada, he'll give you the whole enchilada. And it's all based on your free will. Correct? Yeah. Here's the seed of your spirituality. There's the seed of your emotions. Your lusts of the flesh all come out of your body. Here's your morality compass. This chart here explains patients who have severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia, Borderline personality disorder, severe bipolar. Those are the spirits behind those mental illnesses. Yeah. So if you're going to be ministering to the mentally ill, this chart here is something you're going to have to become very familiar with. It's in chapter 21 of Pigs in the Parlor. Pigs in the Parlor. Yeah. The Hammonds were superstars in deliverance. They had as much trouble with these pay type of people as everybody else did. <clears throat> Mentally ill people are very difficult to get delivered. So they broke it down for us in an attempt to understand what we were facing. But even when you understand what you're facing, well, it is really hard to get a mentally ill person to repent because the distractions in their mind are here and a regular person that we work with are down here. It's a confusion ramped to the max. But this process here is the same there or here. Everybody's built the same. Yeah. Any questions about that? Huh? Uh, now, the devil wants to control this number one and this number two. Okay? And if he can get you to live an emotional life, you will never find your destiny. Okay? Your emotions are betrayers. 
they will betray you. You cannot trust them. If you don't believe me, uh, just check out your last three marriages. It should have never happened. Yeah. But because the devil manipulated you emotionally, you married somebody you shouldn't have, you became business partners with somebody you should have never even shake hands with, you adopted kids you should have never had anything to do with, on and on and on it goes. If you are led by your emotions, you're a, you're a carnal Christian and you live a yo-yo Christian life. Well, up this week, crashing the next. Up and down. And it's exhausting. Most carnal Christians backslide eventually. Some two or three times. So if you're a carnal Christian and you don't feel the love of God, that then generates depression, loneliness, fears. I don't feel God anymore. Yeah. A Christian who lives out of their spirit man doesn't need to feel God. God's word said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. They already know he's there, whether you feel him or not. They have a stable Christian life. This one has a yo-yo Christian life. You, you cannot trust your emotions. They'll, they are betrayers. All addicts are soul-based people. This emotional pain has to be pushed down. And what do I need to do that? Chemicals. Chemicals work great. Alcohol is beautiful for that. They're giving out crack pipes now in major cities. You get a little government kit with a crack pipe in it, and you go to a clean injection center, and that's the government helping you. <laughs> what they're really doing is getting rid of you. Yeah. That's what they're really doing. <laughs> We're not going to spend millions of dollars housing and rehabilitating drug addicts. What we need to do is remove them from our society. What's the best way to do that? Let's give them a crack pipe kit. Wow. Thank you. And there they go. ODN, everything. Well, that's how you get rid of them. That reduces, as Scrooge said, in a Christmas carol, well, maybe they should be gone and reduce the surface population. That would have been an interesting quote if had anybody known who Scrooge was. Uh, Scrooge is a uh, nasty guy in the movie A Christmas Carol. It's played every Christmas. Nothing? Okay. <clears throat> All right. All addicts. Emotionally based person. Food, sex, drugs, alcohol. Emotions. Being manipulated by the devil like a sculptor. Driving the person to do things they don't want to do. No one who is an addict wants to be an addict. And I'll tell you that. I don't want to be an addict. This is crazy. This, is, this life is nuts. Yeah, we know that, but what's the root problem of it? It's always, it's always here. So a spirit puts a thought in the mind, hey, you're so-and-so is going to leave you. Oh, so-and-so is going to leave me. Oh. So the devil then puts the negative thought here to inflame the person's emotions. And so that thought then becomes reality. That's real. Mm -hmm. 
soul-based people fall in love often. I'm in love. <laughs> no, you're not. You're, <laughs> you're about to get your face kicked in. <laughs> okay. Love is no reason to marry someone. We're in love. Sit down. <laughs> yeah. Soul-based people, mothers, codependent, sacrificing and giving everything to save the child, no matter what. No tough love, no nothing. Take them back, no matter what. I can't, just can't let them go. It's a trick. The devil is using you to ruin your kids, like he was using that wife last night to ruin her husband. And the guy was already ruined when she married him. And she took him back three times. Now why would the devil want, he, want her to keep ta taking him back? Well, he went religious on her. Oh, you're the wife. You're supposed to be obedient. You're supposed to love. Christianity is love. You got to forgive. Christianity. And so he, the devil uses all of God's word in his own way to get you to make a bad choice. The Bible can be quoted by the yard by the devil. You got the whole thing memorized backwards and forwards. Love is of God. Oh, love. Me telling you that is of Satan. Good luck. It's all, it's all set up. Lady came here for counseling one time. Her husband must have cheated on her, you know, like a dozen times, dozens of times. Always took him back. I said, well, listen, according to Jesus, uh, if your spouse is a fornicator, that's grounds for divorce. So had you gotten a divorce after the third cheating, you would have saved the next eight. And instead of looking 60 and you're 30, you'd look 45 when you're 30. Trick. As Rodney Dangerfield once said, my problem is I attract everyone who can do me absolutely no good. And he was telling the truth. His parents brutalized him when he was a kid. And his whole comedy routine, half of it was real. His parents were terrible to him. And he never got healed. And he became a what? Coke addict. Cocaine made him feel like a human being, like better, he, like he wasn't abandoned, like he wasn't rejected. And cocaine kept him going. He was snorting cocaine after he got out of the hospital, just before he died. He went home and ran in lines. And why was he doing that? Was he a blasting, hardened criminal? No, he had been raised, brutalized. He is emotionally ill. His mother was terrible to him. Dad didn't want him. Everybody rejected him. And uh, hey, you got to do what you got to do. But the Holy Ghost comes along and says, listen, I can do, here's what I can do. I can cure that. I can heal your soul wounds. I can fix you. And that's what I told the lady last night. You're trying to fix him when God wants to fix him. 
and you're in the way. You're destroying your husband. Plunk, hit the carpet. <laughs> you cannot fix a spouse. Yeah. Uh, and just in case my wife is watching this, my wife fixed me though, that's an exception. <laughs> All right. We talked about this several times. There's your conscience, and everybody has a different conscience. And the more you sin, your conscience gets seared. Seared. Yeah. When it gets seared, it doesn't work. So if you do something that's sinful, you don't feel it. So if you're used to yelling at someone, uh, initially, you know, it felt a little off, but after the 5,000th time, it's just like another thing. It's a normal interaction pattern. There's nothing to it. Shut up! That used to bother you, but now it's like, yeah, just shut up. <laughs> See, it's like another thing. So consciences that are seared make sin look like just another thing. It, it doesn't bother you anymore. And that's a politician. You know, when they first got elected to the city council, when they were 25, you know, they wanted to do something good for society. Maybe I can help. Now they're 45, they're in the Senate, everything comes out of their mouth is a lie. They don't even know it. They don't know they're lying because it's now become part of their personality. They don't feel any conviction. They have no shame. Their conscience is seared. Nothing bothers them anymore. They ended up on this list. Their consciences are seared. They're right. Paul put it right there. 21. There they are. Perfect. This relates to that. Any questions on that one? Okay, great. All right, now, people are going to come here, particularly people in this group uh, who are on medications. You know, and here's your basic sections or categories of them. And uh, you got to be careful with people who are on medications because if you tell the person to go off their medications, that's one of the reasons I have what churches call liability insurance. We pay a premium for liability insurance here. What's liability insurance? <laughs> well, that's where you end up getting sued and your lawyers either settle out of court or you go to trial. And if you lose, you could pay a judgment that could be significant. Not, not, a, not a couple hundred bucks. Thousands or millions or what have you. Okay, so if you say to the person, listen, to, you're, you, we're going through deliverance, but you're taking these medications. You've got to stop doing that. Stop taking them today. And that person goes out and has a severe relapse. They're going to come back here and they're going to name us in the lawsuit. And they will name you in the lawsuit. Me, Hardcore Christianity, you, the Arizona Deliver, they'll name anybody in the lawsuit. Okay, the lawyer's job is to name as many entities in the lawsuit as they possibly can. And they're trying to get units of revenue out of each name. So if they list 10 people, they may get nothing out of these three. Those were bogus. But they'll get some, this one will settle out of court, that one will settle, this one will settle, that'll go to trial. They're just hunting for dollars. That's all they're doing. But the problem is, 
if you get named in a lawsuit, that's going to require you to answer the lawsuit. You're going to have to answer it. You can't answer it, so you're going to have to hire a what? <laughs> Lawyers do pro bono work? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Your is grass. And you did nothing wrong. Okay. Secondly, telling someone to go off their medication is spiritually wrong. Okay. So, as you know, people come in here, they have layers of spirits under that demon, then there's a layers of spirits under this demon. Let's say that's a fear demon, let's say that's a lust demon. Let's say this one's a witchcraft spirit. So this person has a dozen or two spirits in there, what have you. All right. This one, these are bipolar demons then. And he's taking medication for that. Mood stabilizers, right? So you go, well, we, we, gotta, we gotta get you off medication so we can get all the rest of these demons out. Okay? Not knowing that the body is now physically addicted to the mood stabilizer. So if I suddenly yank that off, the body is going to have a negative re reaction, probably some kind of withdrawal, right? So people call here all the time saying, uh, my, my son is a, an addict. Do you guys uh, have a place they could stay? I said, nobody does. They have to go to St. Luke's or Good Sam or what have you, go through detox first. Dream Center, Refuge, nobody's going to take somebody into their program who has not gone through detox, right? They don't have detox at these rehab programs. They're not licensed for that. They're not able to do it. They don't have the medical personnel to supervise it. They're not, that's not gonna happen. And okay? we don't have it either. We, we can't detox people. The detoxing process is not spiritual, it's physical. The, the body is hooked on whatever they're taking. They can't stop. That's why they call it an addiction. They can't stop. If you had 5,000 addicts in your house and said, all right now, everybody with a strong free will who can stop shooting up, let's do it, okay? One guy or something. It's not going to happen. They're not going to go, oh, I, you know, I, I'm kind of tired of being on crack. I'm going to quit that. I think I'll switch over to caffeine-free tea. <laughs> okay, that's not going to happen. The demons in the body are not going to let it happen. Your body is not going to let it happen. You've, your body is addicted to whatever that thing is you're taking. Okay, so that needs to be weakened or broken somehow and the only th way we know how to do it is through detox program, right? You've seen that TV show Intervention? You ever seen that? Pretty good show. And uh, what's the problem with that show? Well, it's the same problem AA and NA has. It, it doesn't really work. You notice at the end of the show, uh, Bob left the center, he punched out his A counselor and is now burning down buildings in San Francisco. Almost all of them fall out of the program. Why? There's no spiritual aspect to the program. There's no deliverance. There's no Holy Ghost in those programs. They don't work. So and so did great. She was here three months and then she ran off with her boyfriend. Her family has not heard from her. That's at the end of the show. Remember that? That's almost verbatim what it says. Again, they're not taking care of the spiritual root of the addiction, which is what we're trying to do here. But we cannot tell somebody to go off their medication. That's something 
that is going to get us in big trouble. And it's not going to help. It could make it worse. So what I do is I say, look, we're, we have gotten all these spirits out. You're doing great. You're feeling better. Oh, I feel wonderful. Go to your doctor and tell you, him or her, I'm feeling wonderful. I'm going through counseling at this place. I'd like to reduce my medications. I'd like to reduce them. See? Then we're off the hook. You're off the hook. And we're helping the person. And nobody's going to get sued. See? Is this making any sense? It's not that we don't have any faith and we don't trust God. It's looking at the reality of the situation. The body is addicted to whatever they're taking. And the body doesn't have a brain. Your mind is in your brain. Your body reacts to whatever happens to it. A beating, food, drugs, the body just reacts. And when you remove it, suddenly you're liable to be facing an explosion of trauma, which then will affect the mind and the behavior, and the person may go nuts. Right? It doesn't look like anybody's mad at me, so that must have gone over. Some of you are kind of passive aggressive, and I'll get it later, but you got to be careful with medications. Right? You cannot be on the ministry team if you're going to tell people to go off their medication because you've got faith and the rest of us are unbelievers. We're going to have to get rid of you. That's not how the system works. You're going to hurt people and you're going to hurt us. We're going to be in trouble around here. All right. Okay. Now, I want to warn you about these people here. Paul mentions at the bottom of the text that some of them had infiltrated the church. Some of these people had got into the church. Okay. So he's, he's uh, warning us about it. Okay. And uh, at the bottom there, it says, they are, Saul, stacked, loaded with sins, which causes them to constantly be learning the Word of God, but they are never able to come to the epignosis, full knowledge of the truth. Okay? And this is a textbook church hopper ministry hopper, YouTuber. They are always going to this person, that group, this YouTube, this video, picking up knowledge, click, 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 but never able to put it all together so they have the full knowledge of God. They can't do it. They're just getting pieces of it. That's why they never get any better. Number 21. Okay. And sometimes uh, this is going to affect your ministry. It has mine. Okay. A couple things here. Uh, I might have made a mistake uh, a month or so ago, a couple months ago. Uh, so I wanted to warn you about it. Um, some lady called me, I forgot her name. And uh, she writes articles for some publications somewhere. And they're doing uh, research articles on deliverance ministries. And she'd heard of me from, can't remember where, so-and-so recommended I ca call you, and so on. And we wanted to do uh, an article on uh, deliverance ministries. And we wanted to include you in there. And um, it sounded fine. You know, I thought, well, it sounds like she's gathering information and 
going to do a report on it. I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. You know, I don't have a problem with that. She said, well, do you have anybody you could interview? I could interview in your ministry. Yeah, here, here's some names. Give them a call if they want to do it. I'm not going to tell them to do it. It would be up to them. So she does. She interviews uh, two people on the staff. And uh, I didn't think nothing of it. Uh, I didn't hear any negative feedback about her or the, uh, nothing. Uh, I kind of forgot about it, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And um, uh, a couple days ago, uh, we're getting ready to do our article now. Can we uh, send over uh, somebody to do some videotapes? And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, how about a couple pictures? I said, all right. Yeah, you can take a couple pictures, include it in the article. So some lady came here last night. She was taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I thought, I didn't know, you know, th this is all on me, okay? I, this is all my fault. I, I didn't research this thing, you know, significantly because I didn't, in my mind, catch any red flags uh, until last night. So I wanted to warn you that... Uh, Somebody is doing an article on us, <laughs> and uh, it could go bad for me. It could have been an expose type thing. Okay, I didn't do any research on it, but this woman, I wish I could remember her name right now. You remember her name? Anybody remember? Holly something. Uh, uh, this woman, uh, apparently somebody checked on her on the internet, see? And uh, like Don Lemon says, just Google it. And so we Googled it. And um, apparently she's written some negative articles about deliverance ministries in the past. You know, So uh, I wanted to warn you that uh, I could be getting blasted here in this magazine, okay, which has no effect on me at all. And doesn't bother me in the least. I'm, just, I'm saying this because you're here. Okay? Not everybody's like me with uh, skin the height of a rhinoceros. I've already been through all this hell numerous times over the years. And so it doesn't bother me anymore. Okay? They could uh, write an article in the paper on me and take my picture and you know, superimpose a, a naked man and then put in pictures of 50 women in an orgy. There's Brother Mike. He's in an orgy in Sunny Slope. And I look at it and go, oh, I'm in another orgy and just flip it. No problem. I have no problem with it. It doesn't even bother me in the least. Probably if I looked at the picture, I'd check the guy's body out. Could you, could, could you have superimposed a Photoshop, a better looking guy there? What about me? It's all here. None of this stuff bothers me at all. And if you, if you don't like me, I'm fine with you. You know, I don't dislike you. I'm good. I'm just telling you this for your sake because not everybody's like me and they're not able to you know, blow everything off like I do. Some people get emotional about being attacked. Okay? Two years ago, three years ago, I got an email. Hey, Brother Mike, you're not going to believe this. Somebody did a, a YouTube video on you. I said, they did. It was probably positive, wasn't it? They have my picture there and everything. We're winning. No, it wasn't positive, Mike. It was... It was, uh, so I go to the YouTube thing, and it's, it's a thing where they, you know, they say this, then they cut that, then they put that section, and then add that, and cut that, and then add, cut and paste it. So it looks like a vomit festival here. And then the article is, oh, this, this psycho, uh, what was the name of that YouTube? Uh, The church, the church that uh, makes you vomit up demons, I think was the name of it, or something like that. I saw that clip. Did you read the bottom? The people noted everything was positive. I listened to Mike. I yeah. Was yeah, I saw that. So, so I looked at the video. <clears throat> yeah, I looked at the video and I thought, well, 
I wish they would have used German. <laughs> yeah, but I, I looked at the video and I go, man, this is pretty bad. And I thought, this is wonderful. I'm, I'm headed to the big time. People are making fun of me. See? It's like the kid you beat. Uh, they'd rather be beaten than ignored. I'm like that kid. So I was fine with the video and I thought it was great. They were showing me acting a fool. Just another day at the office. <laughs> you know, and then I told the Lord, hey, I'm not going to say anything to this person. I'm not going to call them right now. I'm just going to blow this off. And then what German just said, uh, I think he secretly wanted to be in the video. <laughs> he said, oh, all the, posit all, the, all the string under the YouTube was all positive. They say, oh, you shouldn't be talking about Brother Mike like this. The, as people were coming to my defense, which is the first time in my entire life that ever happened. <laughs> and uh, so the whole thing was fine. So I'm, I'm said all that to say this. If that article comes out and I'm getting vomited eyes again, that's a term I made up. <laughs> Just, hey, that's fine. We go there. Yeah, Mike's nuts. No problem. What's, what's next? That's what I... And that's what I recommend you do. If you're going to be in the ministry, these people are going to turn on you. Okay? There's going to be people turning on you. People you have given to and helped and bent over backwards. You've invested your time in them, sometimes your money, everything, man. And all of a sudden, you turn around someday and there's a spear in your back. Mm -hmm. It's part of the ministry. It's normal. It's normal. The prophet Rodney Dangerfield was right when he said, quote, people are nuts, unquote. Once he realized that, he didn't have any problem with people anymore. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like the talk you should have had with your daughter when she was younger about marriage. Did you ever have that talk with your daughter? Well, you left something out. You, f you forgot to tell her, honey, I love you, but listen, lower your expectations. <laughs> if you lower your expectations, okay, you'll be a much happier married woman. <laughs> because, here's why, uh, your parents, particularly if you're a daddy's girl, they tend to over compliment you. You're my sunshine, you're my princess, you're my queen, oh you're beautiful, oh look at that outfit. They tend to pour it on too much, too, too receptive, too positive. Mm -hmm. And the child mistakenly absorbs that. See? So, so that leads to a, a bunch of emotional issues. You know, the child's spoiled, they have high expectations, they want a superman for a husband, they want to be catered to. It, it can lead to unrealistic expectations when the parents are too complimentary of the child. <clears throat> Oh, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. You're the greatest thing that ever lived. Oh, you're so my princess. Oh, you're royal. Okay, well, that may be true to you, but in the real world, your, your daughter, your son, isn't perceived like that. Okay? And you don't want your child seeing themselves like that. Okay? Paul said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. He said, look at yourself realistically. Yeah? And so if you do that as a person, you will not take offenses from people. You will not get upset when they make a YouTube video mocking you. You'll just be able to relax and move forward. And you won't have 
a bunch of soul wounds and emotional pain that you generated and that your parents helped generate, okay? No, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but you are not a queen. You are not a princess. And you, you, are, you are not the most beautiful woman in the world. Yeah. Don't send me an email. I'm just telling you that's not true. That was a love statement. You were pouring it on, okay? And I did it to my daughters. I, I went overboard. You know, you're the smartest, you're the best, you're this or that. It's a parent thing. It's a flaw of a parent. It's, it's just simply an expression of love that kind of goes overboard, okay? The, you know, the, your, your, your daughter does not look like Marilyn Monroe. They, they don't have a great career in film. They're, they don't need to get used to signing autographs. <laughs> Give someone a realistic view of themselves, okay? And then when they become a born-again Christian, they'll have a realistic view of themselves. Hey, I have nothing, but I have everything in Christ. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I can't do anything, but in Christ, I'm able to do everything. And so your, your realistic view of yourself in Christ, tremendously productive. Because you're not seeing yourself in an elevated position in this world. You're, you're realistically looking at yourself, like Paul said. And so there's no reason to take an offense at somebody who thinks you're an idiot. What you should have said was, let me, let me analyze that. Maybe, maybe I am an idiot. Let's, let's take a look at that and see what the facts are. And let me analyze that without getting emotional. And you will improve constantly. Okay? <laughs> you know, that, if, you, if you treat your kids like that, then when somebody offends your kids, you're going to come to their defense. Wait a minute, how dare you? You're going to run down to the teacher. You're going to get him all emotional. You're not going to see the screw-ups your child did that you should have objectively looked at and fixed. Okay? If you realistically look at stuff, you're going to be a much happier person and a much less frustrated person because you're not constantly living up to somebody's expectations. Did you see the autobiography on uh, the Jeffrey Epstein's girlfriend, what was her name? Uh, Jelaine Maxwell. Jelaine Maxwell. Jelaine Maxwell. Okay, textbook. Okay, here's a, here's a mentally ill person raised by a billionaire, given everything in the world from the time she fell out of the womb to every moment of her life, handed to her wealth, position, uh, hobnobbing with kings and queens and heads of states and other billionaires and yachts and millions of dollars in clothing. Okay, now she's in prison for the rest of her life. Okay, no. No. Do it like Warren Buffett did it, right? Hey, you, son, you got to earn your own way. <laughs> You're not going to give me $40 billion? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, so go the Buffett route, not the Maxwell route. Okay? And your, and your children will not end up with life sentence in prison. Yeah, she grew up with a total entitlement mentality. And anything I do, I'm going to get off. Including recruiting 14-year-olds to have sex with my boyfriend. I'm fine. My conscience is completely seared. I was raised spoiled to the bone, and I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm fine. It's not wrong. <laughs> she didn't think it was wrong. She does now. She's in prison. When you go to prison, you think that's wrong. But that's, that's a different Bible study. All right, so... If we take a look at this at the top, here you see 
Paul uh, itemizing what we call narcissism or NPD. Okay? This is a person, Philetus, who is in love with themselves. And if you've ever met anybody who's a narcissist, it's frightening. It's, it's actually scary because nothing you say gets through to them. Nothing. Uh, no matter how much you hurt, they cannot relate to it. No matter how long you beg, they don't get it. And it's because they can't. They can't get it. It's, it's demonic. It's satanic. They're textbook manipulators. They're usually very intelligent. Most narcissists have high IQs. No matter what evidence you present to them, they will circumvent it, explain it away, send you a cloud of gaslighting you won't even believe. They'll blame you for it. When's that going to happen? Well, it's going to be happening in the last days when Calipus, dangerous times shall come. And we're staring, staring at it right now. We're looking at a potential police state. We're looking at uh, the government wanting to monitor your checking account. We're in a surveillance state now where there's cameras all over the place. Every crime in a mall or anything like that is on the nightly news. They're covered from different angles. There's the parking lot angle. Here he's coming out in the hall. There he's in the store. Everybody is being watched. Okay? It's all narcissism. They want to know what you're doing, where you're spending your money, who you associate with, how much you got in your bank account, what you spend your money on in your bank account. <clears throat> the government wants to tax everything and everyone now. Okay? They're trying to expand the tax base. And they don't want anybody to slip through the cracks. They are coming for us now. And these are dangerous times, just like Paul said. They're dangerous times. This defund the police movement was a satanic setup. Here's what the devil did. He gets everybody to turn on the cops. Cops are bad. Defund them. Then, down the road, he brings the cops back. Cops are good. We need more police. Crimes are going nuts. We need more cops. Then the cops come back and they side with the government. The government then comes looking for you. Guess who's going to come get you? Cops. The cops are going to come get you. You think a politician's going to leave his house at 2 in the morning, come over and get your block? They don't leave their house. They're, they're, at, they're over at their mistress's house taking a nap. They're going to send somebody to get your gun. Who's that going to be? Girl Scouts? No. The devil gives you something, then he takes it away. Then he gives it back to you. It's a setup. We're being set up. Who's that psycho that lost all that money in the friend was his name? Cyber? Cyber guy? What was his name? What was that young kid's name? The biggest law pyramid scheme in history? 
crypto. The Bitcoin thing, crypto. What was that guy's name? Friend? Something friend? That kid? Yeah. You seen that kid? Yeah. <clears throat> that was a satanic setup. Here's what happened. The cyber securities got away from the, the countries. It's, it went out to sea. You can't tax that stuff. Okay? So they set up a system that caused it to collapse. Okay? This guy steals everybody's money. People are losing billions. Okay? Now, the next step, we got to regulate this thing. This, the devil creates a crisis. Then he sends in a solution to fix it. He never just lets it go. Because the devil thinks this way, we only think that way. What's, what's staring in my face today? That's how humans think. He looks long term. That idiot that lost all that Bitcoin was a setup. They wanted him to do it. Sam Friedman? Friedman. Friedman's in there. Have you seen pictures of him? He kind of looks like a jelly donut. He walks around. He's dumber than a box of rocks. There's no way that guy could have ever done anything. They set him up. This is what we want you to do. We want you to lose billions. Something's got to be done about that. So the devil's going to come in and fix that. Oh, we need to regulate all this stuff. This stuff has to be illegal. This has to be monitored. We can't just let everybody invest their money in something we don't have any control over. You see that? The devil gives you something, then he takes it away. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know what happened when you got married. The devil gave you your wife. Oh, boy, she's really great. She's got a good heart. She's this and that. She's funny. We get along so well. Nope. And he takes it away. Why? He thinks long term. He thinks down the road. This is not how he thinks. He's way down there. We're down here. What's going to happen? Number one. NN, National Narcissism. Who's the narcissist? It's going to be the government. The government. I know how to monitor your money. I know how you should spend it. I know how much you should be taxed. I know what kind of guns you have. I know what guns you should be allowed to have. I know where you ought to be allowed to go. I know where you should drive a car. I know what kind of car you should drive. I know what groceries you should eat. Oh, you, you're eating too many vegetables. You need to start eating bugs. Oh, we need to start eating grasshoppers. <laughs> Got him. Oh, there's one. Oh, oh these, these are great. Everything is narcissistic control. The devil is a narcissist. That was his only mental illness. It cost him his kingdom. Ezekiel, I will be like the Most High. I will rise to the heights of the cloud. I, 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 I. It's happening right in front of our eyes. <laughs> You, you, you're driving, you know, you're not driving that car, you're driving this one. You're not eating that food. Oh, no, you're not eating peanuts anymore. No, no, you're eating millipedes. Okay, I, I can't, I, right now I'm not, I can't adjust to eating bugs. I'm just not, I, I'm not used to that. Oh, nothing and be happy. And, yeah, own nothing and be happy. Own, only own what we want you to own is the way it is. See, they know they can't get you down to nothing because people are not going to go for that. It's all, it's all over our society now. 
I mean, you, you, if you got up in the morning and turned on the news at seven o'clock, you, you would hear punchlines, the same ones you're hearing at nine o'clock at night. Same little catchphrases. Well, they, Reuters and the other uh, press releasers, they're all orchestrating this thing. They put out key words every day, and then everybody just repeats those things like that. Okay. Why? Narcissism. He's trying to control us, and he's going to do it. Okay. And you are the last line of resistance. You're it. Wow. There's nobody left. Number two, Philagoras, somebody who emotionally attached to money and material things. I can relate to that. I spent my whole life chasing bucks, chasing money, 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 making money, investing in money, stocks, real estate. I had all those things. What a waste of life that was. I wasted 40 years of my life chasing the Almighty Buff. 40 years flushed down the toilet. The devil had me, man. Boasters. Aren't the Academy Awards coming up? Tomorrow or something? Nobody watches that anyway. <laughs> Number four. Hooper Ephenus, that's somebody who thinks they're better than somebody else. <laughs> Calvary is the ultimate example. Calvary. The person who actually was better than all of us went to the bottom and took the worst position you could have. <laughs> Blasphemers. What is blasphemy? Blasphemeo. What does that mean? Cursing. Cursing God. Right? It's, it's uh, desecrate, desecrating something sacred. Okay? So, we all got together and we decided that since uh, a mighty prophet of God had sat in this chair, uh, I think it was Kelly. We decided that this chair was sacred. Okay? And we're all going to get together today and anoint this chair and dedicate it to God as a sacred vessel of godliness. And we're going to pray over this chair and pour the anointing in it. <laughs> And whoever sits in this chair is going to get healed at a minimum of their hemorrhoids. Sit. <laughs> okay. Now, we all dedicated this chair, right? But that person over there didn't like that. They saw us do it. And so they knew we did it. They know we love the chair. And they said, that chair is of the devil. That's a satanic chair. What did I just do? Blasphemed. I blasph blasphemed. So, there's a million ways to blaspheme, and all of them are forgivable by God, except one. One is not forgivable. So, if I blaspheme your chair, and I go to God and I ask for forgiveness, the blood of Christ covers it, and my sin of blasphemy is now gone. I never blasphemed. The sin is gone. You can have your chair. I don't care about it. I've been forgiven. I've moved on from your holy chair. I'm not into it. I'm fine. God forgave me. No more blasphemia. Church 
church building, a person, whatever, doesn't matter. You can be forgiven. Any blasphemy. Blasphemy Jesus. Jesus, you're a boop, 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 boop. That's blasphemy. It's forgivable. There's only one that isn't. Yeah. Disobedient to parents. Oh, man. That should have probably been higher on the list, but the reason that's so high, six, is because it's the only a sin that brings a curse on you. So if you trash your parents, the devil is allowed to curse these people. So if you're uh, praying with somebody out there, and it's very common for them to have ought against their mom or dad, that's routine. You'll see that all the time. You also need to focus on their curse. They were cursed. And so, honoring your parents uh, has no exception. So let's say your, your dad's a drug lord, your mother's a whore. And they pimped you out. Okay, Is that all wrong and sinful and bad? 100%, we all agree. But... When you said, F you, Mom, screw you, Dad, when you did that, clunk, the demons heard you. Now there's a curse on you. Okay? If you do some other sin, you know, shoplift, whatever it is, no. No cursing falls on you. Disobedient to parents, uh oh. Uh oh. And what is a curse? Well, it could be a thousand different things and manifests in all kinds of different ways financial curses, physical curses, different, different things can go wrong, relationship curses. But when somebody has a curse, you can always catch it if you follow the pattern. If there's a familial pattern, it's usually a curse. Usually. So if you see the same sin coming down the family tree, ooh, that's a red flag. Somebody got cursed. Oh, everybody in my family, they all, they all had miscarriages. Ah, oh, something went curse. Everybody's kids are in jail. My cousins, my sister, my all their kids are in jail. Everybody in jail. My grandpa was in jail. Great grandpa was a bootlegger. Curses. Clyde Darrell, you need to stop robbing banks. Shut up, Mom. Oh. Clyde just set himself up for this. Shot him on the way to town. Okay? A curse pounds on you, then it kills you. That's the pattern. Beating, 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 die. You're cursed. Number six on the list. Big. So always deal with that at the counseling sessions or at the altar. You always try to see if there's a curse pattern while you're talking to them. It's easy to see. You know, repetitive things are usually pretty easy to spot. And that has to be broken off after they repent. They have to repent first. So if you uh, got a curse from your parents when you were uh, saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong, and I don't like that, and you're hurting me, and why do you keep hurting me? Why won't you change? And if you, everybody has parents like that. But not everybody says, ah, F you, Mom. Uh-oh. When you did that, something's following you now. You're being followed. And you're going to pay a severe price for it. 
misery, 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 die. All curses lead to a person's death. That's the goal of a curse. They want you dead. So that's something you got to deal with at the altar or in the counseling session, right? Got to get that fixed. Okay, you notice most of these uh, qualities uh, on the list here fit with a narcissist. If <laughs> you notice that, that's an interesting tie-in here. Unthankful, unholy. <laughs> There's a narcissist for you. <clears throat> Without natural affection, what is that? Astragus? Is that somebody who likes to have sex with goats? No, that is uh, people who grow up and they have no familial love. As a parent, you're supposed to love your kids. As, as a spouse, you're supposed to love your spouse. As, your, as a son or daughter, you're supposed to love your father. Natural love. Family love. Someone who has no family love. They don't care about their relatives. They don't, they don't have any affection toward them. Ugh. 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 <laughs> because Jesus said, what's the extension of that? was what Jesus said. The day is coming when, when parents will betray their children to death. Children will betray their parents to death. Your real enemies in life will be members of your own household, he said. What's that mean? Paul explains it here. They don't have any natural family love. Yeah? Family love is... You know, like you experienced, your relative isn't perfect, they screw up, they hurt you, but you still love them. Right? That's not going to be the case in the last days when dangerous times come. Dangerous meaning the kid betrays the parents, the parents betray them. It's dangerous. Just like Paul said here, perfect. They don't have any natural love, okay? You see that all the time, more often with fathers and their children, less often mothers and their children. Mothers usually have more love for their kids than their dads do. Where's your dad? I haven't talked to him since I was in third grade. What happened to him? I think he's living in San Francisco somewhere. No natural affection, no fatherly love for their children, gone. That's what he's talking about. Family love. It's not there. They don't care. They're not interested. Yeah. Could that come from a cursed mind? Or could it be just open? I hope I know that they go open for a demon? Yes. Or is it, is it just the later days that just people are just behaving more? Yes. Well, um, it's hard to say not having this specific person, but I would investigate all of them if I was you with the person. Because it could have come that way. What Paul's talking about here is the net result. What's the bottom line here? They don't care about their family, is what he's saying. That's going to be a typical pattern in the last days. What's a truce breaker? Yeah, Aspinus, that's a person that. Yeah, I'll do that. Oh, absolutely. My word is gold. There you go. Incontinent. What is that? Somebody has a bad bladder? No, acritis is, a, <laughs> is, is the uh, word that means that person can't control themselves. Their emotions just take off. Wow, my mind just starts racing. Oh, jeez. I don't know what happened to me. I just, I got mad for no reason. Well, did you have to get that mad? I mean, all they did was drop a pencil. I don't know. I just... Anybody like that? Yeah, everybody would raise their hand. Oh, I know a guy exactly like that. I'm living with him. Um, <clears throat> false accusers. Big word here. What is that word? Diabolos. The devil. Okay. Now, this word, diabolos, uh, 
got mistranslated in the King James Bible. Jesus is sitting there at the Last Supper and he says, uh, Have I not chosen all of you? But one of you is a devil. Remember that? Yeah. From the King James Bible. Yeah. Well, that was mistranslated. It's this Greek word right here, diabolos. But it means a false accuser. And so when you translate it as false accuser, here you look at the context, they translated it correctly, 2 Timothy 3. They mistranslated it in Mark when he said, Judas was a devil. What he meant to say was Diabolos, a false accuser. In other texts, Jesus said the devil comes and steals the word out of their hearts, right? That should have been translated as the devil because it's Diabolos, same Greek word, but a different context. The context determines the translation of the text. So if I mention to you car, that has no real value. But if I give you the context of the car, Tesla, uh, the Jetsons. Okay, now a car to the Jetsons was quite a bit different than a Tesla or my Honda pickup, right? I, my, my truck is unable to fly. <laughs> so you got to look at the context of the word to make sure you've got the interpretation correct, right? I wish I had George Jetson's car. I would love to have that car. <laughs> what am I talking about? Stupid. So anyway, the medical field took that word and used it to explain what? People who needed depends. Incontinent, meaning, meaning no bladder control. But actually, it, it's an expanded term. It means a person who can't control themselves. They're constantly living out of their soul. Because hmm? they're living out of their soul. Yeah, absolutely. Not of course. Constant, but consistent. Yeah. Ongoing. Of course. Yes, carnal Christians have. Terrible times with self-control, yes. right? Very difficult. Fierce and amorous. They're savage every other night on the news. Some video camera catches some guy beating the stuff in out of a 80-year-old woman at the mall or something. It seems like it's every other night. Call silent witness if you've seen this guy and he's got the person down, he's kicking their heads in, they're unconscious. What does that mean? In the last days, dangerous times are going to come and we're going to get these people at the altar here that God is trying to pull out of the fire and he wants to use us to pull them. So you'll be seeing these people in living color here in your ministry and in your ministry, not just here, but where you, wherever you minister. Okay, and I hope you're going to be ministering somewhere. They despise those things that are good. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine that? 15 years ago, if you would have told us that it's okay for boys to go in and have a bowel movement in the girls' restroom, we would have looked at you like you were literally out of your mind. Just 15 years ago. Nobody would have thought that was normal. What? You're going into the girls' restroom to take a leak? Why don't you go into the boys' restroom? Well, I, I identify as a light bulb, and it's too dark in there. So I, I mean, things are happening now. You can't believe or conceive could possibly happen, but this is the beginning of the great delusion of the tribulation. It's all, This is the pre-delusion. People are 
rejecting what they see and hear and only going with what they've been told. It's happening right in front of our eyes. It's happening right now. Paul is like up to date. Traitors. Jeez. They're going to infiltrate your ministry. Okay. They're going to sneak in on you. How do I know that? It's happened to me so many times you wouldn't believe it. I mean, <laughs> it just happened to me two weeks ago. Some guy was in the ministry here for years, off and on. I did, I did everything I could to help him. I set him up in his own ministry. I, everything. What happened? Turned on me, stabbed me in the back. What am I doing about it? Nothing. I'm moving on to this Bible study. I'm not interested. Okay? But this is something that's going to happen to you, and you're not going to be able to get away from it. People are going to stab you in the back. And this is after you have bent over backwards and killed yourself to help them. You put your reputation on the line. You gave them stuff. It just happened to me two weeks ago. A guy did it to me. <laughs> I, I, I never did anything but try to help him. And <laughs> right in the back. Who cares? I don't know. I don't. I'm just my moving forward. <laughs> you know, that's, that's another notch on my belt. Oh, you stabbed me in the back? Hold on a minute. Click. The notches go all the way around. I'll just add you here to the front. Next. That's how you got to look at it. Don't, don't take anything personal. Do not do that. Yeah. Brother Mike, you've never met my spouse. I have met them, and I know you're in trouble, but don't take it personal anyway. Don't get emotionally involved. Huh? You're only damaging yourself. Yeah. Your ultimate goal is what? You're going to be dead soon. <laughs> and you need to make every year count for Christ. Because when you drop dead, I spent 40 years chasing chicks and money. None of that survived. Not one. I put in 40 freaking years. And ended up with a big fat goose egg. All right. But if you give somebody a cup of cold water in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you will not lose your reward. Amen. That sermon will preach. Somebody steal that. <laughs> High minded. There it is. To follow my. Have you ever heard the old saying? Hey, listen, don't blow smoke. Up my. That's where that came from. That Greek word means to blow, smoke somebody out. In the middle of a fire, you can't see past here. You've been smoked out. Gaslight. That's what it means. And that happens all the time. Every time you turn on the news, it's the same thing. Somebody is blowing smoke everywhere. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Wow, no kidding. He said they will have a form of godliness. Morphosis is the, where we get our English word to morph. Right? All these Christian denominations, they're all virtually useless spiritually. They do have some charity work that's good, social services that are great. Spiritually, they're useless. But they appear to be godly. They talk about Jesus, they talk about good things, 
They talk about loving mankind. Ooh. They talk about helping others. They talk about being generous. <clears throat> it's morphing you. It's fake. What do they deny? If you don't believe me, just next Sunday, just travel around, go to the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church, Episcopal Church, go to this one, go to that one, Christian Church, go to that one, and you tell me, call me up, hey, Brother Mike, I'm over here at the uh, Episcopal Church. How's it going? Your Holy Ghost blowing a place out? No. <laughs> no, we're going through. I'm, I'm, I'm reciting their prayer now. It's in the handout. They have a form of godliness, but they have no Holy Ghost power backing it up. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's morphing you into something that's not real. Paul spoke about it in Corinthians. He said there's another Jesus out there. And that one's fake. But he appears great. And they are doing what? They're always learning something new. Right? What's behind all the seminars all over America? Everybody goes around. A new speaker, a new idea, a new book came out, a new idea popped up. Everything, it's all morphing nothingness. It's all fake. Yeah. yeah. I know why they're doing it. I mean, the, the theory is they're, they're helping people a little bit. They're making good money on it. Um, they're able to fund some good projects. Hey, we're, we're feeding these the vets. We're helping the homeless. I understand the rationale behind it, but the bottom line is what Paul just said here. And they have a form of godliness. Wow, these are good people. They're friendly. The greeter at this church is great. He shook my hand good. <laughs> Everybody came up and said hi to me. Oh, yeah. The pastor talked about how we ought to be more socially responsible. We need to donate our, some of our money to good causes. Oh, okay, good, good. Can somebody close in prayer? Hallelujah, amen. Did anybody get healed, saved, or delivered? No, but we have a form of godliness. It's all... God here, but no power. Now, all these people you're going to be ministering to in your ministry. Okay? Okay? And let's close with this. And you see these, this group of people here. If you have any of these traits, you need to get rid of them before you go in the ministry. Because you're going to end up in a Hillsong scandal. And it's going to be embarrassing. And very painful for you. Right? When you look at someone and you see a speck in their eye, if you have a log in yours, Jesus said, what you need to do is first take the log out and then you can see clearly to get the speck out of the other person's eye. <laughs> Jesus was not saying that verse vindictively. He was saying it matter-of-factly. He was just sharing a simple fact. You have a log in your eye? Okay. It would be better if you took that log out so you can see the speck in his eye more clearly, he said. It was an intellectual argument. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Nine times out of ten, as I said last night, if you monitor your emotions, you will know what's wrong with you and what needs to be removed. If you have emotions, 
envy, bitterness, anger, jealousy, hatred, frustration. <laughs> if you're sensing those coming up in certain environments, well, Brother Mike, I must be completely delivered right now. I'm listening to you and I feel wonderful. <laughs> That's a normal response I get. What it is is, that's a false positive. Okay, you're sitting here and you, you feel fine. It's a false positive. What's that mean? God will not leave you sit here. What he will do, he will take you and allow an uncomfortable situation to occur so that whatever's in there that he knows about, that you may not know about, will then manifest. How's he going to do that? Well, he might send you somebody. He might put you in, around some people. He might make you do a certain task, whatever it is. Somebody will talk to you in a certain tone. Whatever that thing is, each person's different. It's all individualized. And what he's doing there, he's telling you, my child, look, you got to stay in here. You didn't know you had. You didn't want to think about it. And since you've been feeling better, you've been going through deliverance and you feel better, you then, you then said, well, I'll get to these some other day. And so the Holy Spirit then puts you in an environment where that thing manifests and it's unpleasant. And it's him saying to you, hey, this needs to be removed because I have all these giftings and anointings and ministry I want to give you, but I can't give it to you with this stuck in your craw. In Louisiana, they call it the soul of a craw. Yeah. You can't have stuff stuck in your craw and fulfill your ministerial destiny. You can have a ministry, but you won't make it to where you're supposed to be. Right? You know, some preachers say God has a permissive will and a perfect, perfect will. That's kind of a way of pointing it out. But some people go so far here, they stop, and they're okay with God's permissive will, and they just stop there. And I'm trying to encourage you to go past that and get to His perfect will for you. What's He called you to do in life? You have a calling of some kind. You're supposed to be doing something wonderful. You're doing something good now, and we're grateful for that. Nothing wrong with that. But there's a spot for you out there. And if you don't keep auditing yourself, you'll never reach it. You can't do your taxes in 2018 and then stop. I did my taxes. Well, wait a minute. This is 2022. Did you do them in 2021? No. 20? Right? No. We got problems here. 2020, 2019, 20. We got to do your taxes for those years, too. Well, this marriage didn't work out. I'm, I'm like a batter. I'm in the on-deck circle. I'm going to go, go up and hit again. No, no, you're not. You're not getting married again until this is fixed. Okay. God has this person picked out for you, and he sent him in and then stopped. He sent her in and it stopped. But I cannot send that person in. Because that person is going to be hanging around you. <laughs> That's a problem. Okay? Your job in life is not to hurt good people. It's to fix yourself so God can send you someone that fits and is not going to blow up later. If you send somebody in too early, it's going to be a disaster. So said, well, I don't want to get married again. Well, that's fine. Paul said, hey, it's better for you to be sing single. you got more time to serve God. I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm just saying, if you happen to be of, this, of the ilk 
that you want a companionship and love, this is your best way to get it here. Fix these things. Renew your mind so God can send you the person he picked out. You can't pick again, okay? We can't afford that anymore. <laughs> oh. Okay? If you pick again, it's going to be Razor Blade City. You're done. Okay, don't do it. Let your Heavenly Father pick your spouse for you. That way you don't have to do like Brother Mike and end up with a string of divorces. You know, don't be like me. Okay. I figured I can handle this. Uh, I've learned from the, from the last three or four. I, I'll get the fifth one. N no, get healed first, and then God will send you a spouse. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I don't believe him. I know you don't believe me, but it's true. Your Heavenly Father has everything picked out for you. Not just a spouse. He's got a career. He's got friends. He's got your ministry. Everything. He's got your future all stated right there. Right? He has it. But that doesn't mean you're going to get it. That doesn't mean you're going to get it. You have to conform to God's perfect will. It's up to you and your free will. You got to, you got to do the one thing humans hate: submitting. Humans do not want to submit; they want to be the boss. They want to be in charge. Eve, Adam, they wanted to be the boss. We can't make it like that. We're not the boss. We're we're servants. We're followers of Christ. We're believers. We are. We have subordinated ourselves, submitted ourselves. Right. Yeah. And if you submit yourself to Christ, hey, these people that stab you in the back, it, it, it doesn't affect you. You're not that hurt because you're not focused on that person. You're, you're already submitted over here. You're, you're over here. You're not there. But you're not going to be hurt if somebody bags you or leaves you or steals from you. If you have no motherly or fatherly love or family love, man, you got to get that fixed. Yeah, that's a soul problem that's going to come back to haunt you. I wrote them off. I haven't talked to my son since 1992. Oh, you're on this list right here. Not without natural affection. Yeah. Well, they did this and that, and they told me this. And that. Stop. Stop it. I'm talking about you and God. This isn't about you and somebody else. You can tell people who don't have any natural affection are not going to be very good evangelists. <clears throat> you know, it's hard to love a stranger when you don't even love your own family. Right? And difficult. And you can repent of it. And just get rid of it. The most important deliverance minister you'll ever meet is yourself. The most important deliverance you'll ever go through is self-deliverance. I've had a couple dozen ministers come in, I'll close with this, that, uh, you know, Brother Mike, I've been waiting. You wouldn't believe it, man. God called me when I was young. I was supposed to go into this ministry or that one. And it hasn't happened yet. And okay. I hear that a lot. What do you do with that? Uh, I just investigate and see what blocked it. That's all you got to do. Something blocked it. Something blocked it. Uh, 
Nineveh. Jonah. I want you to go preach to those Ninevites. I don't want to go preach to them. They're scumbuckets. I'm a racist. <laughs> I don't care if you're racist. But I want you to go preach to the Ninevites. I've been calling you. I'm calling you. He said, well, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know. So sometimes that's blocking it. Uh, people get called to do things they don't particularly emotionally want to do. Whatever's blocking your destiny can be fixed. Anything blocking it can be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in counseling for over 40 years, and most of the people I've counseled, not all, most wouldn't recognize themselves if they passed them at Walmart. They're usually very good at analyzing others, and they can tell you all about this person and that one and this one, but telling you about themselves, wow, struggling. Struggle. I've met people that have never even met themselves. My dad was one of them. My dad used to blow my mind. I was talking to him one day and he said, these neighbors down here, uh, it's unbelievable. His, the, the dad just left the family. They don't have any income. And uh, he's been gone for two or three months. He hasn't paid any child support. Can you believe that's terrible? <laughs> and this was years ago. I'm staring at my dad like I'm in a state of, like I've seen a Martian. I'm just staring at him. That's what he did. He left us when I was, we were kids. He never paid any child support. What was going on there? I just told you. Most people see themselves as a total stranger. They're so used to looking at others. It's a demonic thinking pattern. You, 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 you. They never look at themselves. And his emotion was genuine. That poor woman, he just walked out and left them. <laughs> My mouth dropped over. I was staring at him like I was looking at the brain from Planet Arrows. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's a UFO experience. My parents were flat broke and were living in Tempe, and I was supporting them years ago. This was back in the 80s. And uh, they didn't have any grocery money one week. Okay, So I went over there and gave them a couple hundred bucks to go buy groceries. The following week I went back, and uh, my dad started telling me a story. <laughs> Whenever my dad would start telling me stories, you know, I would grab my chair and just brace, I'm sitting, ooh, ooh, or, and he said, uh, these, these people had come on the, the property and they were homeless and this and that, and he, he had given them 50 bucks for, to, go, to go eat. <laughs> and I, my dad look came over at me again, jaw hit to here. Eyes went to there. I had just given them two hundred dollars the week before because they didn't have any money for food. He took fifty fifty dollars from my what I gave him and gave him to this guy. Then Dad said, "The guy never paid me back." <laughs> Clunk. <laughs> oh. I know what you're thinking. I'm making this up. That was an actual story of your parents who, in all honesty, they're nuts. Some of your mom and dads are nuts. Mine were nuts. They were alcoholics. They were, they had crazy behaviors. <laughs> 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 
But my dad, he wouldn't have known himself if, if he walked in the room and sat down beside him. He would not have known who that person was. Mm. Had no self-introspective insight of any kind. Mm. Nothing. And you can't be that way and fulfill your destiny. You've got to take a look at yourself and say, hey, i got to get this thing fixed. My dad pulled into a parking spot at uh, Home Depot in Kansas. And uh, he went in and got something, came out in a hurry, cranked up the Kia, and looked to the side, nobody there, backed out like that, and this passenger door, door uh, the light poles come down, and then they have this like round cement. What's that round cement stuff that they put the light poles in? It protects it and everything. It's made out of concrete, yeah. right? So if, if you hit that thing, it's not going somewhere. You are. He pulled out, backing out, passenger door, right into the, that round thing. And I mean, boom. It sounded like a bomb going off. And I came over to see him the next week. I got out of my truck and was walking up the driveway and looked over and saw the car. The entire passenger door was smashed. Okay, this, this isn't something you could buff out. Okay. This was a major, this looked like somebody hit him, you know, coming down the hill at 40. And my dad said, Dad, what happened to the Kia? He said, oh, Home Depot, they've got those, uh, flag, uh, those lights thing down there. Uh, pillar base, po pillar, I guess he used, whatever it was. <laughs> he said, they shouldn't have those there. <laughs> All right, that's the last story my dad I want to tell you. But I just, I told you that story to get you to see my overall point, which was, if you become like my dad and you don't have any ability to look at yourself and you can't track your emotions and you don't understand who you are, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. I was at the Dream Center Tuesday and this girl sitting there and she pipes up. She said, well, these people that were counseling us, they said that... Uh, uh, if we go back into our past and then we drudge up uh, things that uh, uh, hurt us in the past and people who hurt us in the past, she said that that was going to damage us and that we shouldn't do that and we should just ignore it and so on. And I thought, man, now see, that's the secular counseling approach to people. That's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to face it and remove it. He wants to remove it for you, okay? So if you face a molestation issue and that pain comes back, the Holy Spirit wants you to do that so he can pull that out of you and you voluntary of your free will, give it to him. And so I had to tell that girl, no, that's not the best method to do that. That's not going to work. The Bible requires that you confess it and you repent of all the negative feelings you have to that person for what they did to you and how they hurt you, and you have to pray for that person. Well, she clammed up on that one. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah, I don't get paid to uh, wishy-wash stuff. I have to just tell them the truth, and that's it. If they don't like me or they don't want me back, well, then I'm out of here. And you cannot compromise your ministry. Correct? Correct? You're not going to be a compromiser, which means you're not going to compromise yourself. And, hey, we turn that light off there. All right, thank you.
<laughs> Father God, in the name of Jesus, uh, I thank you for these monthly meetings. These are my favorite ones. And uh, every person here tonight who hasn't faced themselves, I hope they will come forward for prayer. Uh, any person here tonight, this afternoon, who who needs to break that curse off themselves from their mother or dad. They uh, let their parents have it when they were younger. And the devil took advantage of that and put a curse on them. And things have gone bad since then, financially. They've had bad relationships. They've had bad earnings. They've had bad investments. They've had bad friends. All of it's gone wrong because a curse has been placed on them from dishonoring and disrespecting their parents. And I know that you're eager to forgive them and eager to break that curse off their lives. So I hope they will stay for prayer today. The ministry team's going to be here to help me. And I know they're anointed and they have the Holy Ghost. And I know people will get healed. And I know that every person who has an open and broken heart that comes to you gets healed 100%. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We'll see you next month. Right here on the fourth Saturday of the month at noon. All right. Anybody who needs prayer, come on up and hang around for a little bit. If not, that's okay. <clears throat> I did send you an email. I did send you an email. Are you okay? At first, I sent it um, in uh, the email autocorrect because I sent it to you almost a week and a half ago. But did I answer? You didn't because you didn't get it because oh. I sent it to the wrong email. It, it autocorrect. It changed one letter. Oh. Yeah, so I caught that and so I, I sent it back to you probably within the last, I want to say, three days. So. To Mike at Hardcore? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll check it today then. I'll check it today. That's my mom back there. That's your mom? Yeah, that's my mom. So. Oh. Yeah. She, was she here a lot before? Yeah, she was here last month. Yeah, everybody was praying for her yeah. over here. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. How's she doing? She, she is doing, I think she is much more. Much more? Alert. 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 Oh, really? Yeah. She, okay. When I look at her, she just looks so But, like, I wanted to. So that's what uh, I think. Okay, what? Peter told me to sign Pete. Pete, the big guy? Yeah. He left. Yeah, so yeah you want to bring her in for a one on one? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, okay. you sent me an email, so I'll send it. Okay, I'll check it tonight. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. You got any questions? Uh, I was interested in that. And in the prairie. Oh, okay. What, what's uh, somebody mentally ill, you know? Uh, me. You're mentally ill? What's the diagnosis? Uh, so I have ADD, I have ADHD, uh, bipolar. Uh, yeah, you got diagnosed with bipolar? That's what they're claiming. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so. I don't really believe it, though. Real quick. Well, uh, what's the symptoms? Crazy. Uh, uh, what kind of symptoms of bipolar do you have? Uh, like crazy mood swings. Like mood swings, okay. Yeah, yeah. Alright, now here it is. Like real high and real low. Alright. Now here's how it works. Okay. Usually when they're a kid, somebody hurts them or scares them bad. Did that happen to you? Mess at 11, okay. Who did it? Uh, a counselor at a camp. Oh, what was his name? Uh, it was a girl. What's her name? Rachel. Rachel, okay. Rachel Greenberg. Okay, so Rachel, was it molestation or intercourse? Okay, so she, sedu she seduced you. How old was she? Well, I wasn't really aware of it. Like, I'm pretty sure I got, like, drunk also. How old was she? Uh, 19. 19, okay. So, what happened was, this girl here, she had lost a demon. 
She's a pervert. Her. When she molested you, uh, that spirit and this spirit got in you. Usually this one gets in. Usually in this area, right here. Huh? Then, these demons start attacking your emotions, causing mood swings. So when they go to the doctor, they try to put them on out. Mood stabilizer. So for the last Try year, I've stopped taking all the medications they gave. And then the mood swings are what? Do you have one today? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah. What time? Uh, I mean, all throughout the day. I mean, like, like yesterday, I blacked now, out for like four hours. Like, I have no recollection. What time was that? Uh, that was like from 11 30 at night to like 2 40 in the morning. Now, when you woke up this morning, at what time? Uh, I woke up this morning, it was 8. Have you had any mood swings after 8? Uh, more like depression, more like down. Like depression? Down or feeling, yeah. Did you have any mood swings since 8? Uh, no, I've kept to myself. Like, I was feeling good, and then, like, like I get angry, like, real fast. Did you get angry today? Yeah, with my dad. Huh? With my dad, yeah. Your dad? Oh, what'd your dad do? Uh, long story short, I'm going through some court stuff. You're going through like, what? I'm going through court, like, legal stuff. And, uh, I was supposed to, like, courts asked me to show that, like, I'm changing. You know what I mean? I'm, like, changing for the better. Uh, so I was, like, trying to get a job. And he's like, why even bother? Like, you could be going back to prison in, like, a week. So it's, like, anything that is also good, like, he, like, wants to support me, automatically I trust it down. He does? Yeah. Okay. So it's being flipped out. Why bother even telling you? Okay. Like, why bother asking for help? You know what I mean? Like, if yeah. you tell me you're going to help me and not do it. No. Was your dad like that when you were little? Uh, yeah. yeah. He, he hasn't changed? No. Okay. So you can see here how easily this happened. Did you used to have a problem with lust? Huh? Yeah. yeah. So you can see how easily Rachel molested you. That got in. Your dad let this one in. Right? And then you ended up with bipolar. Right? And you have severe mood swings. Yeah. You happen to notice something about this diagram. This is you. There's nothing wrong with you. He's doing it. You got angry at your dad. He's doing it. It's not you. She molested you. You didn't do it. It's not you. It, it's them. He has bipolar. That you got fear from your dad. He never supports you. Yeah, fear, doubt. Yeah. yeah. It's not you. It's them. If you turn your life over to the Lord, you can get these things out of there and you'll be healed. I did that September 21st last year. You did? What happened to you? I got baptized. What happened? I got saved. Did you sense anything or feel anything? Nothing? Okay. All right, so you uh, okay we pray for you? Yeah. Okay. So let your hands down. Now, see how tensed up you are? That's how I always am. Huh? I'm always tense. Yeah. Now, uh, what I just said applies to that. They're doing it. 
Not you're not doing it. They're doing it. It's not you. Okay, and they're also blocking the Holy Spirit because you said when you on twenty first of what? September twenty first. September twenty first. When you gave your life to the Lord, okay, the Holy Spirit should have come in then. But they're blocking it. God loves you, He doesn't love them. There's a difference between you and them. They gave you these symptoms. God loves you, not them. Do you follow any of this? There's nothing wrong with you. They're doing it. I definitely felt like it was me. Huh? I definitely felt like it was me. They told you it was you. They want you to think it's you. That's their job. Yeah, they do that to everybody. It's not you. It's them doing it. It was your dad's demons doing it. So you're going to have to turn your life over to Jesus today. Not like you did on the 21st. You think you could do that? Hmm? Okay. Now go ahead and close your eyes there. And uh, he's going to lead you in a repentance prayer and receiving Christ. Just repeat after him, okay? Thank you, Jesus. I scared you, didn't I? I scared you, didn't I? We could talk about you. Yeah, girl. Yeah, I wanted to share something. Now, what's going on here? Yeah. We were just, I was just, you would like prayer? Yes. What's, what's wrong with you? Huh? What's wrong with you? Right with me, no. <laughs> no I'm only kidding. Um, physically or mentally? <laughs> Mentally. Mentally. Everything. This, I don't know. Okay, now I'll, I'll take over. When you was a kid, did somebody hurt you? Oh, yeah. Who? My, everybody. Who? My mom, my dad, my brother. What would your mom do to you? Everything. What, what was the main thing? She beat me, whipped me, lied on me. Oh, what does my mom do? Um, was your mother abused as a child? Her, I heard she was. She never... She was an arc. Okay. That's why I like this thing today. It was okay. right on. Now my dad was one too. Now here's how it works. It's really simple. Your mother got abused. A spirit entered her body. It was a rejection demon. The rejection demon hated you and told her to hurt you. So you would pick up a rejection demon, which you did. Then you rejected yourself. And then the rejection demon told you that was your mom. He lied. They used her like a puppet to get to you. And you got mad at her. And you hated her. Close your eyes. Father God, in the name of Jesus, she got tricked by demons. They told her to hate her mother and a curse fell on her. I taught on it today. And it ruined the rest of her life. And today, in the name of Jesus, we are going to forgive her mother because you told us to. She dishonored her mother because she thought her demons were her mother. She was wrong. They used her to hurt her. And she unknowingly, unwittingly destroyed her life. Because she did not understand the spirit world 
and that demons had legal rights to place a curse on her because she cursed her mother. She hated her. And today she's going to repent of it with everything she's got because she cannot afford to live even another year like she's been living. Her life is a satanic misery and it cannot continue. And I know you love her, Lord, and you want to heal her. And she's going to repent right now in Jesus' name for hating her mother. Go ahead. Help her. Help her repent. What's your mom's name? Barbara. 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 Okay, the Barbara's demons have to come out of here right now for you to be free. Here we go. In the name of Jesus. Valerie. Valerie. Take a breath and blow. Good girl. Come out right now, mother. Mother. Barbara, you get out of that right now. Mother. Up and out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out, Barbara. You no longer can. God forgive me for hurting my mother. I'm so sorry. It was my sin. I was wrong. I didn't understand. Please forgive me. I want my mother out today. Out now. I want to be free. 20 years of misery is enough. Out. Out. Come out. Come out. Hey, ask that guy if he wants prayer in the blue shirt there. Come on. Get out in Jesus' name. Spirit of rejection. Boom. Out. Come out. There it is. There it is right there. That's him. Here he comes. Come on out. There he is. Come out of her. Come out of her. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come out. Come out. I repent of this evil sin of hating my mother. Out. Come out. Devil, come out. Devil, come out. Devil, come out. Come out. Satan, come out. Satan, come out of me. Come out, Barbara. Get out, Barbara. Come out. Evil, come out of me. Evil. Hating my mother is evil. Evil. Forgive me, Lord. I don't want to face judgment and die and go to hell because I hated my mother. I don't want to face it. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Come on. How's it going? Huh? Good. How are you doing with your self-deliverance from getting the spirits out? Um, you doing good? Uh, how's your How's your praise going? Thank you, Jesus. How's that going? Good. Are you speaking in tongues yet? Tried? Okay, go ahead. Good, keep going. Come on. Good, 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 good. Keep going. There you go. 
Vano Mashatra Saba, Elo Mashindrima, Heal this guy. Holy Spirit of God, heal. Holy Spirit of God, heal. Holy Spirit, come out. Come on out. Come on. Get out. Get out. Come on. Come out. Come out. Rejection. Come out. Rejection. Come out. Rejection. Come out. 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 The devil is going to destroy you. You are going to repent today and get these demons out. This is your chance. God is extending you mercy and love. He's trying to help you. Come on now. I should have never hated anybody. Lord, I was wrong. That's a sin. And I want this demon of hate out. Hey Bob, how's it going? Yeah, just because you have that thing you're talking about, like you're, when you know, I was a kid, younger, you know, and my mom was raised up, you know, I cuss there. And, you know, I mean, I was riding petty because I was doing drugs, thinking about me, you know, and not my mom. And I love my mom the whole lot, you know, and I always, I repented of, you know, basically myself and stuff like that. But this guy that you were saying. What'd you say to her? Just cussed at her and got mad, you know, at times and said bad words to her. And, you know, I was doing drugs, so I didn't care, you know, it was all about me, you know, it was the me, me world. You know. What's her name? Clara Jennings. Clara? Clara Jennings, yeah. Is that her first name, Clara Jennings? Yeah. Whole name? Will that he's got too. Huh? Will that too. You know. Okay. All right, you ready? Yeah. Father God, Robert came forward today and uh, he confessed and he cursed his mother, which then put a curse on his life. And his drug use got worse. And his life got worse. And today, we ask you to forgive him for what he done. We ask you to forgive him, Lord. You have mercy on his soul. And we ask you to break this curse off of him in the name of Jesus. The curse of dishonoring his mother must be broken in Jesus' holy name. In Jesus' mighty name. We command this curse to be broken off of Robert's life and all these bad things that have happened to him. We break off this nightmare from the gates of hell. If his mother was here right now, we'd all be praying for her and we would all be blessing her. I'm so sorry for what he did. And I ask for forgiveness and the blood of Jesus to break this curse off right now. Break. Break off. Break off. Break off. Break off, devil. Break off, Satan. Break off, Satan. Let's go. Let's go. Come out. A curse of mother. A curse of mother. Off. The curse of mother. Off it goes. Mother, come out.
Mother, mother, go. 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 Out. Get out, get out. 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 Go. Come out of that body right now. Hurry up. Get out of there. Come out. Come out. Come out. Out. Come out. Come out of there, Satan. Get out. Satan, come out. Come out. Come out. Thank you, Jesus. How old are you? Oh my gosh, you haven't repented of that? You're kidding me. 76. Good girl. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I repented of it. I'm 76. Hallelujah. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I should have been dead when I was 70. Six more years you gave me. Thank you, Lord. You're going to give me another six years. Thank you, Jesus. Six more years of good health. 82 coming up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I am not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid anymore. Come out. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not insecure anymore. I'm not weak anymore. Thank you, Jesus. 82. 81. 80. Hallelujah. Many more years of good health. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 76 is young. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There they come. Out. Out. Get out of there. Come on out. Come out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, dear Lord. I'm 76. Out. Get out of there, you devil. I release my mother from my soul. She, I give her to you. Lord, I let her go. Yes, Lord. I let her go right now. Yes. Let her go right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The teaching you did today, I had this band go around my head. Yeah, it's a band. It's called a Desmus. It fits right here. Like it went that. around my head like a helmet. Yeah. Desmus is it. Left. Then it left. Yeah, that's a mental illness ban. All mentally ill people have it. Like that. It's, it didn't squeeze, I just felt it squeeze. Boop. Pops off. Felt it yeah. You have the anointing. Yeah. Oh. Came right off. This guy has a band on his head. Can you get cast it out of him? The band right there. Yeah. He has a band right here. It's right here on his head. Band right there. See that? See there? He has a band like you had on your head. It's right there. Right here. We break this band of mental illness and complaining. And go. We break this band off there. We snap it off. Snap it off. Snap off. Pop off his head. Pop off his head. Pop. Pop. Release in Jesus' name. Pop. Release in Jesus' name. Give it up. Let it go. Let it go. Give it up. Give it up. Let it go. We've had it a long time. Give it up. Surrender it right now. Snap off. Snap off. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Snap off his brain. Snap off his brain and go. Snap. Snap. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Get out of there. Oh, go. More coming up. There it goes. Thank you, Jesus. Come out there. Come out. Go. Come out. Go. Out. Go. Hurry up. Let's go. 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 Thank you, Jesus. There we go. 76. Hallelujah. There it goes. 76. The lie of concealing your age. The lie has to come out. The lie of concealment. Go. Go. Concealing your age is a lie. Come out. Go on. Come out of her. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How'd that go? Getting better or worse? A little better? Good. The more you use it, the more it improves. If you use it more, it gets better quick. Did that band come off your brain? No, <laughs> Call that brain. You get out of there. Come out of there. Come out of there. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks, how are you feeling? How do you? I'm doing good. How do you? How do you? How do you minister to someone who's have a sexual lifestyle? How do you minister to them? Somebody who's gay? Yeah. How, oh, that's how, hard. How has the Holy Spirit led you to minister to them? Well, well, see, when it was, I, I have a co-worker in Cave Creek. I work with. Their, they own a restaurant. I know something bad happened to me with men. I can, I can sense that the Holy Spirit. You mean like you got molested or something? Did you get yeah, molested? I, I don't know. They didn't say. We, I asked them because I tried to witness to them. Hey, do you believe in God? They said no. So something told me it's like something bad happened to them. Yeah. Because they used to hang out with boyfriends. Now they're in the same sex. <laughs> so the, how do you listen to him? Um, does he want prayer? Or anything? Does he want prayer? It, it's a female. It's it's a, a female. Does she want a prayer? No, I haven't asked him. I just wonder how's the holy how did the how's the Holy Spirit lead you to minister to those kind of people? I usually just ask him. If they want prayer. Yeah. Okay. Something something like unoffensive. Okay. Do you want prayer? Need somebody to pray for you? I'd be happy to do it. Okay. You know, some kind of a loving, loving statement. Because preaching, and then preaching to him, preaching the word will not work. No, no, you got love works. Yeah, love works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you say the Lord, uh, homosexuality is a sin, they'll get offended. Yeah. You know, love they won't get offended at. Right? Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. Always go with love first. Ask, ask, and you shall receive. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies.